الحمد لله الذي لا يضلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحسن عماءه العدون ولا يؤدي حقه المتحدون الذي لا يضركه بعد الحمام ولا يناله غوص الفقن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين عبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع بنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاحرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العصر والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملمس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم الجمعين إلى يوم الدين ما بعد فقط قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تكونوا كالذين نصوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجه The view from within a analysis of the self has been our ongoing topic. Tonight is our ninth lecture. Last night we took a break from our topic and we spoke a little bit about the importance of the night of Qadr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our amal from last night. And one point I want to make here to myself and to all of you is that the nights of Qadr now have passed, but as I mentioned uh, two nights ago, uh, actually, last night in the speech, I mentioned the fact that uh, many of the ulama of akhlaq have said that now that the night of Qadr is over, the new year, the new spiritual year of every single human being now has begun. And so let's take this as a reset button. Let's make this as the, you know, as day number one of our inner revolution. Let's make promises to ourselves and to God. Let's put forth the proper tools, the proper processes. Surround ourselves with the right people to ensure everything that I promised and I talked about last night, and I'm going to now convert that into actual action. Let's not make last night a one and done idea. Let's ensure that last night's movement, a lot of you were emotional, a lot of you were into the amal. You know, alhamdulillah, one of the blessings of having uh, the amal done at home with the family online is that you had multiple uh, amals being done by various ulama, really all over the world. And so, you know, you can go back and forth, like many of you told me you did. But sometimes for the Quran Amal, you would go to this place, and then let's say for the Dua'i, the ocean, you would go here. Whatever the case may be, we had, mashallah, a array of spirituality last night. Let's ensure that we convert that energy last night into actual action. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our Amal and forgive our sins, inshallah. But back to our topic before the night of the Qadr. We have been looking at this idea of the self. If you remember, I talked about the importance of the I inside of me, the I-ness, as they call it in psychology. What does it mean when I say me or I? We talked about the first three opening nights of my, of, of, of my discussions at Al-Mahdi. And then we went down the practical realm. We took a very overall, kulli, absolute topic and filtered it down into a little bit of a, a practical discussion. And we talked about four avenues, four tools that destroys the self. Remember the process now a few nights ago, right? Takhliya, tahliya. Takhliya is the pulling of the weeds. Takhliya is the planting of the seeds. The planting of the seeds cannot happen. The planting of those tools of growth cannot happen unless the barriers of growth are removed from the ground. Same, same way with us. Our hearts cannot be uh, accepting of those seeds of change of those instigators of change, unless those barriers of change are identified and then removed bit by bit. Now, yes, it will be a parallel process eventually. It's not that you will eventually be rid of those vices and then you can grow, no. But at least initially, if it's a backyard full of weeds, we can't even begin to think about growing anything new unless we begin the process of weed pulling. Now, we talked about the various weeds inside of our heart that need to be pulled and identified. The first one being a negative thinking, right? It's pessimism that sometimes we go through. 
the idea that not only do I not trust anybody around me, I don't end up trusting myself when it comes to God, and I don't end up trusting God himself. That will be the that protect us from that level of suedan, of pessimism. And then we talked about the ego, and Ummul Fasad, right? The mother of all corruption, of all internal corruption, is this ego we have inside of us, this narcissistic dimension inside of us that simply just wants to feed the beast within. And we talked from there, of course, we now um, talked about the idea of fault finding, Ab Jui, as they call it, in Farsi and Urdu, I think, right? The idea of now looking for faults in others. And that really stems from a very dark, dark place that we are in, where our ignorance of our own faults leads to the intolerance of the faults of others. Why is it that one mistake by our spouse and everything blows up? Why is it that one mistake by our parents everything blows up? Why is it that we're not able to tolerate the faults of our fellow community members? Part of the reason the ulama of akhlaq say, backed up by Western psychology, also says that we are not aware of our own. The moment you're aware of your faults, you become tolerant of the faults of others. And that's where I left you before last night's Shabda Qadr discussion. In concluding this mini subtopic within the grand topic of, of the self, I want to look at another week to be told, and then inshallah tomorrow, leading all the way up to the weekend, the last night we have a week left, as you can imagine. Um, and then we, we, we talk about those, those seeds that should be planted for. Um, for growth and for, and for revolution. But I want to make sure I leave all of you in, in, in the month of Ramadan with a positive note, right? Not this idea of the ego and crushing this and negativity. No, let's first, no, those are important, but you know me well enough to know that I'm a positive, happy, go lucky kind of guy. So let's end off the discussion, end the month with a positive discussion. The next four or five nights, we'll look at those seeds of change that should bring about a very beautiful and a refreshing change inside of us. Before that, however, tonight, and tonight's discussion will have to do with the dunya. And again, I told Amini, may Allah bless his soul, he says that one of, if not the only um, vice, or the only weed, um, or the only barrier that can be equated with the ego is the love that we have to this world. And when he says love, he means the attachment we have to this world. Now, this topic has been talked about a lot. I know me myself, I've spoken about it several times across several years, but because the world seems that it's getting harder and harder to, to detach itself to, it's important that we constantly remind ourselves of this reality. There's so many things the Ahabi can talk about on this topic, but I want to look at it through a different lens. The first thing I want to, uh, I want to mention to all of you is and I have to get this out of the way. It's important that all of us establish this first and remind ourselves, or maybe for my uh, older youth, we're getting a little bit older now, I'm 12, 13, 14 years old now, is that you know one way that you can look at this coronavirus right now, this pandemic, is that sometimes you know these bala, these hardships, these tribulations, as dark and gloomy as they are, as much as they lead sometimes to momentary pain and momentary anxiety, there's always a silver lining. There's always a message within that hardship, be it our personal hardship as individuals, as families, as communities, or right now as a global community. And one thing to understand, I mentioned this before, initially when this pandemic hit and we were all in quarantine, you know, I was up and down this webinar and that speech and this and that. I mentioned several times when people were kind of like, what are we doing here? What is all this going on? Like, how can we process this seclusion? One thing that I had to remind myself of, and maybe all of you, was the fact that one beautiful thing that will come out of this pandemic, a lot, of, a lot is negative, people are dying, people are suffering, right now people are sick, people are sick, and you know, we ask Allah to grant them, you know, to grant them a shifa, grant them a cure, grant them some treatment for those who are suffering from this virus. Again, like I always say, be it our brothers in faith, or at least our equals in humanity. But one thing that is the bright silver lining is that you truly get to really understand the vulnerability of this world. You understand just how sometimes weak it is. How much money is there to be spent? You know, they throw out millions, billions. This, this amount has been gone towards the, the vaccine research. This, uh, the, the, you know, the best of the best of doctors all the world. 
are convening, blah, 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 right? The World Health Organization, you know, for sure, they're, you know, they're exhausting every option they have, financial, uh, intellectual, medical, but they still can't come up with any other way to stop the vaccine and stay at home and wash your hands. The dunya now becomes vulnerable. And it literally now is brought to its feet by one vaccine. Now, why do I mention this? Because when we go to attach ourselves, invest our emotion, invest our money, invest our heart, invest our time to something, we want to make sure it's stable, right? Like if I'm going to invest my money into a business and buy some stocks, I'm not going to buy stocks into a company that I know will go bankrupt in a matter of time. I know that you know they're a sinking ship. With the ad advancement of time, the business is actually losing more and more money. Why would I now pour my hard-earned money or my hard-earned faith into a sinking ship? You don't jump onto a ship that's sinking. You try to jump off that ship. Right? Don't hang on to the rail and say, no, I'm going to go down the ship. No, you're not. That's, that's just not, it's not a Titanic we're talking about here, right? Talking about you know something that's very, very near and dear to our money, our faith, our family, whatever the case may be. So the first thing is that one thing that we, I want myself to extract from this is this idea that um, that this dunya is very vulnerable. It's perishing, right? Everything will perish, the Rahman says. The only thing that will remain or that will be baqi is the waj of Allah. The essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first point is, I want us to start to see these silver linings and these pandemic and hardships. Okay? This is not a world to invest in. This is not a world to sell our soul in. And what I mean by investment, I don't mean to earn. I've made this point several times. And you know, I'll give you one example. And I feel like, you know, I mean he mentions this point. He says Islam doesn't have a problem with you earning money. It's not about earning money. Naturally, Islam is a way of life. Part of that living life is uh, you know, you have to earn, you have to you have to eat, you have to, you have to wear your clothes, you have to buy a house, you have to live in a house, sleep in a bed, naturally. All that requires you to go out and work. Right? It is important that we go out, that we make that distinction between achieving, 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 and attaching. Okay? So where the Islam does draw a very, very solid line is attachment. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Before that, Surah Jum'ah. Surah Jum'ah, you know, Surah Jum'ah, in, in, the, in the middle of the Surah, talks about the idea that, look, before the Adhan of Salatul Jum'ah, you should be working. Nothing wrong earning, working, that's fine. And then after that Salat is done, again, you resume the idea, right? Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, idha nubi la salatu min yawm al-jum'ati, fas'u ila dhikr al-wadar al-ba'i. Right. The moment that you hear that the Salat of Jum'ah has started, go run toward the dhikr of Allah, leave your, leave your business alone. Close up your shop, you know, take a little break, let's say, for example, you know, maybe not work the hour of the Salat of Jum'ah. That moment now it's for Allah. And then the very next ayat, it doesn't say now stay in the masjid all day, read your tasbih and go on the masala and, you know, forget that this is, that this is Jum'ah, the most important day, you know, bury yourself in worship, you know, be in sujood. No, it says the moment that that salat is over, go back into the land. And go and gain and, and, and benefit from the what? From the blessings of Allah, from the grace of Allah. So before Jummah, after Jummah, go out and you achieve, you earn, you make some good money, do it the halal way. It's a different discussion altogether. Do it the halal way. We're not talking about the idea that attachment to the dunya is sitting in the corner with a thrust in your, in your hand and you know your, your, your family is hungry. No, of course not. Where, where, where there is a fine line is attachment. Meaning like, look, the Quran refers to this world as a matah. Okay. In the story of Nabi Musa, there was a man uh, that the Quran refers to as a Mu'min Ali Firaun. Okay. Azakil was the name in, in, in the Bible. His Zakil is sometimes seen in, in the Islamic text as a, as a man who 
was inside the inner circles of Quran, but deep down inside the heart of his heart, he believed in, in the Tawheed of Allah. And he saw Musa as the awaited savior to the Bani Israel. That's why he, on more than one occasion, saved his life. Now there comes a moment now where he makes his faith obvious and he goes out and begins to preach to the people of Egypt. Be it in a secret group or be it here and there, when, when the reins of Pharaoh now begin to lessen in Egypt, Musa's movement is now gaining momentum. This man now takes it as a good opportunity to help and assist in this movement of authority and begins in a small group, begins to talk about you know, the reality of the situation. The Quran in Surah Ghafir captured one of his advices to his little small circle. He says, Ya qawmi, O my nation. Innama al hayat dunya mata'un. Surely the life of this world is a mata'. And that, you know, the, 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 the afterlife is actually, you know, eternity. But it's interesting, mata, what does mata actually mean? In several occasions in, in, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this world as a mata. When you look up a little bit of the, you know, it's, it, it's also a Farsi word, it's an Arabic word. You look up the actual meaning of it. Mata actually was referred to back in the days of the Prophet's time. Pre-Quran, it was referred to as a tool. A tool. So for example, the, the, the example sometimes that the books of Lohat give us is, you know, the, 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 the books of linguistic give us is the fact that if someone is working with their hands to build something, for example, right, and you know, he, he needs to like point to something, it's one of his tools that he's using to, I don't know. Like, like, like build the building or, or whatever the case, he'll say, you know, uh, this is, this is a tool. This is something that's a tool. I use it for what's meant to be used for it, and then I put it aside. Okay. He's not clutching onto his tool, right? He's not attaching himself to his tool. Oh, it's my tool, beautiful tool, my tool is everything. No. You want to hang up, uh, uh, you want to hang up something on the wall, let's say a painting or, 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 or whatever. You grab your, your hammer and get some nails, you, Put it in that thing. The hammer becomes your mata, your mata. It becomes your what? It becomes your your um, your tool. And the moment that you're done with the tool, goes back to the toolbox. You forget about it. Right? We're not. It's not under our pillow. The hammer. Right? We're not polishing every single day. Right? We're not selling our soul out for the hammer. We're not suing our siblings for the hammer. Right? We're not following shaitan for the hammer. So someone said, look, buddy, it's it's a hammer. What are you doing, right? Just use it to, 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 to put a nail on the wall, put it, put it down, and that's it. Why are you clutching onto something that really has doesn't have much value? And the Quran refers to this dunya as that tool, as a tool that's meant to be used in the hands of the believer, not to be used in the heart to love for a believer. It's a tool. And you do with the tool what's meant to be what, 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 what's meant to be used for, and you move on. But we see sometimes individuals who are selling their soul out for this dunya. We're chasing and chasing and chasing at no cost, at the cost of their family, their spouses, their children, their community, their God. How many people do I know and you know in, in, in building their business now? They forgot about everybody. Put a pause on everybody. Let me build my, my, my business for 10 years. These guys will always be here, right? My wife will always be there. My kids will always be there. The center will always be there to save people now all the time. God also will always be there. But this business, these years right now are my crucial money earning. And you pound 15 hours a day, up all night, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you know, online with China, blah, 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 making my millions. Meanwhile, my wife is upset. My kids don't know who I am. My community has complaints. God has complaints. So, hey, man, you got your millions. And when, it's come, when it comes time for you to go back now, this nuts and this desire that you 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 fed him this dunya, that dunya, this money, and that money only wants that taste. When you begin to feed your, when we begin to feed our soul the dunya, the dunya, the dunya, the dunya, the akhirah becomes very sour to us. I don't want it. How do you expect a child to have something that's sour to give him, you know, a, a good five or six things that are very very sweet? No, it's very even spread out, right? So we have to now learn to balance these things out and learn that attachment, this heart is meant for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
it cannot host both this world and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time. A lot of us have this misconception, this delusion, I'm sorry, to think for a moment that look, I can do both. I can live it up in the world, and at the same time, I can you know, be a servant of God. And in this day and age, right now, when things are moving now towards the idea of you really have to, you know, all into this world, something has to give eventually. You don't have two hearts of what I'm saying. And if the heart is a sanctuary of Allah, al-qalbu haram Allah, the heart is the haram of Allah, then again, the example I give often, you know, sometimes in my personal discussions, sometimes, you know, on the member, that, you know, God now is about to enter your heart now, you know, like metaphorically, with this suitcase now ready to move in, this is my sanctuary, this is where I want to reside, opens your heart, he sees everything in this heart. It's already full. Right? It says occupied, no vacancy on the door. And everything this dunya has to offer, from power to money to fame to fortune to, I don't know, women, to all these things are all already moved in. Their pictures are on the wall. Their clothes are laid out. God says, okay, there's no room for me. And he leaves. He's looking for a, a vacant place, a vacant heart for him to come in and begin to set up it, right? And begin to furnish his own, his own room. Can't have it both ways. So yeah, there is a huge difference between achievement and attachment. Allah says achieve. Achieve. This world is yours, but not at the price higher than what it actually is for. A prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa has a beautiful hadith. So I want to read it verbatim for all of you, inshallah. And he says that, talking about this world, because sometimes there is a misconception. I want to share with you this hadith, and then one story, and then it's a possible one, inshallah. He says, detachment in this world. Detachment. What is zuhud, right? Talking about zuhud, honestly. A zahid or a zahida is somebody who practices zuhud. Detachment from the world. Detachment from the world does not mean that you go on top of a, of a mountain and you become antisocial, you don't marry, you don't have friends, you cut off ties, it's me and Allah, me and my tasbi, and that's it. And me and my bowl of kajur. No, it doesn't mean that wrong. Sorry. Detachment means exactly that. That we achieve while we don't attach. Now, what does that mean? He sums it up beautifully in this hadith. The detachment in this world is not to prohibit what is lawful or to leave wealth alone. It's not. We've had prophets who were kingdoms, uh, who, who were kings, who had kingdoms. The, 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 the Imam of our time we're waiting for will inherit, uh, will, will establish a government. With that comes an entire kingdom on this earth will be his. With that comes wealth. He'll have access to resources. Not about wealth. He says, rather, detachment in this world is that you should not have more confidence in what is in your hand than what is in the hands of God. God's saying, look, you know, anything this world has to throw at you, anything. The biggest salary, the best of benefits, the biggest home is nothing compared to what I have in store for you in your life. Nothing. You, you, you think of the most luxurious life in this world. Think about anything and anything you could have, uh, everything you could have. Think about anything, right? The amount of money, the amount of cars, the size of the house, right? Your ideal life, luxury, all, you know, all limits on. Are we to assume for a moment that, that this dunya has anything anything to hold up against what is awaiting for the moment in the hereafter? No. But the fact that we attach ourselves to this world and detach ourselves to that world, we cling to the, the, the things that are perishable in this world while we are ignoring that path in the hereafter, tells me exactly what the Prophet saying not to do, we're doing. Say, look God, I know you're, 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 you're presenting this amazing Jannah palaces and blah, 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 but I really kind of believe in what I have here in front of me. I think that what, I, what, what I've made for myself in this world, the wealth I've acquired in this world, the, amount, the, the life that I have in this world, the size of the house, I don't see myself getting that size of a house now. So I'm good here, God. I'm going to live it up here and take my chances there. Now, part of that fear is, is legitimate. You know, Imam Ali, again, has beautiful, beautiful comparisons. He's like, who would, who would leave a furnished, beautiful, large house into a smaller house that's broken down, that's not kept up, about to you know, break down that is maybe one quarter of the size. Nobody would 
you know, would move out of this house and into that house, you know, on their own. And that's, of course, the downside. Same idea. He says, who would move from the world that we live or the life that we have made in this world to a life that's broken in hereafter, right? We put all of our efforts in, in, into this world. We didn't send anything in that world. So we have nothing waiting for us in the hereafter. So naturally, what we built here, we cling on to. That's why it has to be a parallel process. And it goes to my story. Imam Ali, alayhi salatu wasalam, he is invited to a house by someone named Ala ibn Ziyad. It's a beautiful story and one that I want to end with. Ala ibn Ziyad. These were two brothers, Ala and Asim. So my mom is invited to his house. He walks in, it's a mansion. Right? It's, a, it's a very large house. And the first thing that Imam Ali does is perhaps reminds Allah of what his purpose is. He says, why would you pour all your efforts, I'm paraphrasing, why would you pour all your efforts into building a home like this in this world when you should be building a home like this in the ground. The first thing he does is that he reminds him of his purpose. But then he goes on, Imam Ali. Let me remind you, nowhere, anywhere does he say, you know, sell the house right now, downsize to a hut. This is against you know, anything that I stand for. He says, if you want, a house bigger than this in the hereafter. Listen very carefully. Use this house to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He actually gives details. Invite your family over. Okay. Create that silaraham through this house. Invite those who are less fortunate. Right? Build the bond with your community. Create a home that is a home of Allah and spirituality. Does not, he never once talks about square footage. Or says this house is too big for you. Yes, the whole discussion is there about the outside of what we need. But nowhere in this idea does he talk about the idea of Imam Ali said to him to sell your house. This is too this is too big for you. Just no. Use the house for what it's meant to be used for. You can have this house in this world, enjoy this house in this in this world. At the same time, now look forward to a bigger house in the ground. Because what you're doing is you're using this house not as an attachment tool, but as what? As an elevation tool towards Allah. And the Sulaiman is asking for what? Get Allah in the Quran. Allah, give me a kingdom. Give me a kingdom the size of which no one will ever see after me. And this world. Why? Because Nabi Sulaiman was amazing at bringing people towards the towards Allah. He was a beautiful Mubalit. But he knew that he needed the government and the palace in his hands in order for his friend to be effective. So God gave him. There are some people who are amazing with money. The more Allah gives them money, the more they, they give to others. The more they get, the more they give. The more they support people. They, they, you know, they, they um, sponsor tuitions. They feed the orphans. They build homes. They do all of these things. So Allah gives them more. There are some people who are amazing with children. Allah gives them more children. There are some who struggle with one or two children. They really raised these soldiers of Imam Zamana. So Allah gives them five, six, seven children. Provided that you use that for what? Like I said, for elevation, not for attachment. So this story of Imam Ali is very profound for us. And is, and, and, and is the ideal situation of the idea of what? Yes, achieve, work hard. That means that Allah now blesses you with a good salary. Alhamdulillah. But the moment it comes time for you to detach yourself from that, you detach yourself from that. I've seen siblings, I've seen families that so long as dad is alive, they're great. They're so close. The moment that dad leaves, there's a court case going on. They don't talk to each other for years. I've dealt with those cases. Not in this city, other cities. Can you imagine? That's what I mean by attachment. And the dunya sucks you in. As Imam Ali says that, you know, and this is my last hadith, the boat on the water hadith, it's very profound, one that I, I, I one of my favorites and one that I want to leave you with tonight on the run. He says that so long as the boat is on the water, the boat will sail. The moment the water gets in the boat, the boat will sink. So long as we are in the dunya we're living, we will live no problem. 
the moment the dunya enters us, we ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except our qaleel ibadat, inshallah, we ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, accept our aman. This last week of the month of Ramadan, we ask you Allah, please allow us now to maximize our benefits, accept the past three weeks of our fasting, inshallah. We ask you as a family that when the imam comes, we stand beside him when he, when he arrives and that he sees us as a family that can benefit with Mishnah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.